Hello and welcome back to Dream Girl. Today we are joined by Jehaina, who works in the air traffic control arena and does a lot of other fun things that we will get into now. Yes. Hello, Joe. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? Good. I'm very excited for this conversation. We've been planning this for a very long time now. Yes, 100%. I'm glad I could finally make it. Yes. Great. So tell us, how's your day going? It's good. I finished the night shift, so I got home at 7 a.m. and I had a paratha sandwich because... So good. Love that. <laughs> Fed my dogs. And then I passed out till 11. And then I woke up. So I feel a little bit deranged. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't sleep any longer. <laughs> Spacked my face on for you and showed up. <laughs> I love that. We are very grateful to have you here with your face slaps on. Yes. But yes, yeah, so tell us, what were you doing until 7 a.m.? What's your job, your day job? Okay, so... I'm a day job. Do you call it a day job? It's a 24-hour, 365, yeah. 66 days a year job. So um, air traffic control, not many people know what air traffic control is. Like even when we met, I was the first person I was. that explained to the audience and to you mm -hmm. um, what air traffic control is. So the best way to describe it for adult audiences, I always say I'm like the Google Maps voice for pilots in the sky. And I tell them where to fly, where it's safe for them to go. And I even tell them what speed to fly, what altitude to climb or descend to, which uh, flight path to take to ensure they are going to their destinations safe and sound. And of course, keeping them separated from other aircrafts. Like uh, if you've ever opened flight radar, you see how congested the skies are worldwide. You can't even see the ground they're flying over. Well, oh, wow. air traffic controllers ensure that they stay vertically and laterally separated mm. to reach their destination safely across the planet. So I do that here. So do you speak to them throughout the flight? Uh, no. So I would speak to them if they're in UAE airspace. Mm -hmm. And once they've left UAE airspace, they speak to the next controller. So, for example, if you go towards the west and you're flying towards, the, for example, the U.S., you would go from UAE airspace, then you would go to Bahrain airspace, mm. and then so on and so forth. So they keep switching in between the different yeah. areas. It's like okay. playing relay. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Now tell us the way you explain it to kids, because I love that version oh, yeah? better. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I explain it to kids is... Um, Imagine, uh, we all know Spider-Man, I'm assuming, so mm -hmm. that's your pre-requirement to understand <laughs> this. Um, so Spider-Man has his best friend, Ned, mm -hmm. and Ned calls himself the guy in the chair. And he uh, begged Spider-Man, he's like, please, can I like watch over you? And I am the guy in the chair or the girl in the chair. So I watch over pilots on a radar screen. And what Ned would do is he would sit and watch over Spider-Man on a computer screen. Now, Ned only had to take care of one Spider-Man and protect him from all the bad guys. I have to make sure that I'm watching all the airplanes and making sure they stay away from one another and are following certain procedures as well. Because every country and every unit has their own way of doing things. Oh, wow. And I'm guessing no two days are the same, right? No. <laughs> yeah. I had one of my instructors a couple uh, when I first started off, he would tell me, imagine it's like a deck of cards. Every time you throw them in the sky, you don't know how they're going to fall. Sometimes you're going to have a lot of aircrafts at once because a lot of cards fell in the same place. Sometimes it's going to be beautifully spaced out and you won't be stressed at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, as you were right. Before you, I didn't even think about the fact that there must be someone doing this job. Yeah. And how did you fall into this? How did you decide that this was your career? Um, so it was more necessity than anything else. So I was around 17... 17 going on 18 when I found out I had to take over and be like the uh, breadwinner of the household. We had a little um, negative circumstance that took over when I was growing up and being the eldest child I just made the decision that it is my responsibility to take care of my mom and my two younger sisters. So I applied to as many jobs and scholarship programs as I could find. And I was really hoping to get a scholarship because being a Marathi, you are um, eligible to apply for programs that pay you while they train you and give you a job guaranteed at the end. Oh, wow. But they're super competitive. Not everybody can get in and not everybody can stay within them. And air traffic control was definitely one of the most difficult ones to get into and persevere in. So I had applied and I remember... My biggest goal was financial goals. And I know many people say, well, if you're financially motivated, then you won't love it or you need to love it more than follow it for the money. 
girl, I went for the money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shamelessly. Because I had to take care of my mom, my two younger sisters, and I wanted them to maintain the lifestyle that they had where my two younger sisters are going to private school. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, the home, I didn't want them to be rattled. So air traffic control was the one where I would work and be trained for the least amount of time, which was two and a half years, and get paid the most at the end, and get paid while I'm training. So I said, this is the one I have to get. Mm. And so I applied, and I ended up getting invited to do the examinations, and I got in, and I went through the selection process and everything. And only after I made it as an air traffic controller, like two and a half years later, I found out that I was the second Emirati girl to do it in that facility, and uh, not everybody gets into such a job, like regardless of gender. People that get accepted into the program, only 1% of candidates that apply worldwide make it into the program. Wow. That's it. And for women, worldwide, it averages down to 0.2%. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, girl, if you're financially motivated, yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever it is you set your mind to if you have the right motive and um, push. Mm. So that responsibility is how I fell into it. And then when I got into it, I was like, oh, I love it. It's so intense. It was almost like um, I grew up with such a intense uh, a bringing in childhood and household mm -hmm. that air traffic control being stressful I was like at least this is controlled chaos at home you don't know what to expect so I was like I was built for this oh my goodness <laughs> yeah. I love that yeah. okay it's a very interesting story of how you got into it and the statistics you're sharing are very very surprising right yeah but how was it actually when you got in being you know an Emirati woman in this place where I'm guessing there were not many was there any other girl with you when you started uh when I started no so there was already one girl who completed the training I think a couple years before I got there okay so there was already one that made it and she paved the way right she was I'm working so grateful for yeah. it she, she got there alhamdulillah now it's my turn <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it wasn't a complete shock uh, to the system of, oh, there's a girl here now, because mm. there already was one. They were used to it. Exactly. And um, even though we were low in numbers, mm. um, it wasn't, for me personally, I don't think it was too bad or people have this stigma of, oh, was it that hard for you? And of course, you're going to get positive and negative. Not everyone's going to like you and not mm -hmm. everyone's going to hate you. So I just showed up and I was like, well, this is me. And I was 19 when I got recruited. So imagine... All of this, because I would go to work in a full face of makeup, <laughs> colorful abaya, like I'm ready. And I'm like, hi, everyone. Good morning. And it's like 6.20 a.m. when we, we've gotten to work and everyone's so grumpy. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> so this is the attitude I came in with in this male dominated industry. And I was constantly this like very bubbly person. So it took a lot. To, it would have taken a lot to bring me down. And the only thing that um, would have done that was things going on at home but mm -hmm. I had to learn how to compartmentalize so I would go to work and I actually really liked most of the people I worked with like everyone vibed with me I think the advantage I had was the fact that I talked to everybody but also the fact that I'm mixed race so um, there weren't too many locals and there was there were more expats when I joined so I would get along with the expats and the locals because I had that banter mm. with the expats and with the locals they're like oh well she's one of us as well mm -hmm. so for me I think it was just showing up and being myself and if people liked it great and if they didn't that was their problem and I'm <laughs> glad I had that mentality from the start I love that because okay you know it sounds amazing I'm just picturing you just walking in with your colorful abaya just like bubbly first of all I would hate you because I'm not a morning person oh yeah no no no. many people did they were like oh my god stop there she goes again <laughs> it's like where's all this energy coming from yeah but my question is more where did all that confidence come from um, so I was raised by very strong women, like super okay. strong. So I always tell everybody that I have three mothers mm -hmm. and it was my grandmother. So my mother's mother, my mother herself, who had me and raised me and my auntie, her sister. So all three women, like I say, they have strong, very pioneering spirits. So story time. Yay. We'll start with my grandma. Um, she was an orphan in Africa from a very young age, and despite her circumstances, she ended up going to medical school, married the love of her life, had kids, whatever it is that she set her mind to, she got. 
And, you know, now, fast forward to her being in her 80s, she splits her time between here and the US between both her daughters when the weather suits her. Wow. So <laughs> Love that life for her. <laughs> exactly. You know, she was um, one of the few women in the medical field in Tanzania when she was growing up. Wow. And then when she decided to have children, she's like, actually, I do want to stay home, but I'm going to start a business. So she became a dressmaker. And she used to make dresses for a very influential woman in Tanzania as well. So regardless of what life threw at her, she made it work for her with what she wanted. And then she raised my two, my mother and my auntie. So my mom in the UAE was the third female gynecologist. Uh, so wait, she was the first female veterinarian. I'm, so, I'm confusing mothers. Yeah. My mother was the first female veterinarian in the United Arab Emirates. Wow. So, and this was like, I think it was in the 70s or something, 70s or 80s. Um, and, you know, at first they used to keep her in the lab and they're like, we'll stay in the lab and do all the lab work. And then her little hands saved a baby goat that was being born because they needed much smaller hands to go in there. Mm. And then that's when she started to get the ball rolling and became popular. Um, and she started her own business here. And she, you know, I was telling you about all the animals I have. Yeah. Um, and it's because my mother was a veterinarian and she was a pioneer over here in that field. And my auntie uh, was the third female gynecologist ever in Tanzania. Wow. So I can't believe that was considered a man's job, first of all. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so all these women are so strong, resilient, head on their shoulders. And then they raised me and my three younger, uh, sorry, my two younger sisters. Um, so I feel like they them showing up and being unapologetically themselves and very feminine with everything that they did. They never um, tried to, you know, have a more masculine look or anything like that being in a male dominated industry. So I just watched them and absorbed what it is that they did. And then it came out in me. And when people meet my mom, they go, I get it now. <laughs> That's ex exactly what happens. <laughs> no way. Yeah. No, but that makes so much sense, though, because when you grow up around these kind of people and you see it being done in front of you, your grandmother was an entrepreneur. Yeah. So obviously now you will go out and get things done for yourself. That is really, really nice to hear. And is that what's kind of like inspired also your journey to talk and do public speaking and go around to inspire the next generation of women as well? Um, well, public speaking, I fell into it. And when I fell into it, I hated it at the start because I wasn't good at it at all. Believe it or not. I would not believe that. Yeah, because you met me at a conference when I was on my A game and I've done years of training to get to where I am. Um, so in 2019, I got nominated by work to speak at a panel discussion mm -hmm. and a panel discussion that in my opinion, is the easiest uh, thing to do in public speaking because you can ask a question and you answer based on your expertise. Mm -hmm. And I had never been on stage before to speak, but growing up, I was on stage every year and I did ballet for like a big audience, uh, you know, of all the parents at the end of every year. So I had no problem being on stage and, you know, physically being on stage. I would, I would have done a great dance <laughs> at the Dubai <laughs> Air Show. But to speak, because I'm such a good speaker one-to-one, -one, or in a small group, they thought I'd be good on the stage mm -hmm. um, with the personality I have and the bubbliness. And somebody saw potential in me, but I didn't realize at the time that I had that. So I go on stage and I'm sat there on the panel discussion and all like the big bosses are sat in front of me, like so there to support me, like we're so proud of you. And then I get asked to introduce myself and all of a sudden I'm stuck. It's like deer in the headlights. My boss is looking at me like, come on, start speaking. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then <laughs> um, and then he's like, come on. And then I started speaking and he's like, slow down, you're too fast. And I was like, oh. and then all of a sudden I was conscious of my heartbeat, yeah. my, the, my breath. I'm like, oh, I'm sweating. Yeah. Did you feel hot? Yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh, I'm wearing white. Can they see the patches? Like. <laughs> Like all these thoughts were going through my head. And then eventually I just said a couple of things. And then I was starting to repeat what the other panelists said. But I was just copying what they said because mm. I didn't know what to do. And honestly, it was a disaster in my opinion. And even the feedback I got was I expected better from you. Right. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm just not going to do it again. And that's the easy way out. Thank you. No, for me. Yeah. No, thank you. Mm. And then um, a couple months maybe later. Um, at work, they asked me to uh, give a tour to 40 
uh, the next 40 female leaders doing a leadership course in aviation. So they came to see the facility that we work in, and I was showing them the air traffic operations room. Now, I can talk about air traffic for hours. Like, I love it. So I showed the ladies the room. I showed them where we work, how we work, all of that. And again, I met 40 women that day. And one of them reached out to me and she said, I really like you. Can you come host a conference for me? I was like, no. <laughs> No. No, thanks. <laughs> no, like, no. <laughs> um, so I said to her, I was like, look, I shared my experience with her. She's like, look, you have something. Just come and do the conference. And I was like, no, I, I truly am, don't feel the confidence. And I don't think I can actually do that um, because of this experience I had. And she was insistent and she asked me, she's like, oh, by the way, uh, what, what are you working on this specific date? I think it was sometime in May. And I was like, oh, I'm off. She's like... <laughs> It's meant Girl. <laughs> with your schedule. Come on. So she's like, you're doing you're hosting the show. So you better start preparing on figuring out what to do. And uh, then I hired a public speaking coach. And that also fell in line with just coincidence or some form of coincidence. Because I was on Instagram fangirling over this page called Top of Her Game. Yes. And I was like, oh, my God, there are all these like cool women doing such amazing things. So I like messaged. I'm like, I love what you're posting. And then we got on. I got on a call with her at somehow because both of us talk a lot and then we got on a call and for some reason I had this instinct that told me do you train people to do public speaking and she said yes I was like can I hire you I have the show mm. in x number of weeks so I hired her and we started working on that so my first ever public speaking that I did intentionally with me agreeing to it eventually um, was hosting the women in aviation middle east chapter conference and people you know, when you're hosting, you don't have much of an opinion. You just add a few fillers to connect the show yes. and you just keep flowing and going. And the feedback that I got from a massive group of women, they were like, we just liked seeing you on stage and your vibe. So we stayed for the whole thing instead of just staying for a couple parts that we wanted to watch. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize at the time that this is a huge compliment mm -hmm. because now when I go to conferences as a guest, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> I didn't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> that enough. Um, so, you know, that's th that's when I realized, okay, I have a knack for this. Mm. And then I posted like a small snippet of uh, me quoting one of the ladies that just said something super impactful on stage where she's like, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. So follow your dreams. And I was like, oh, I love that. So I repeated that to flow and then connected it to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And that seven second snippet on LinkedIn went viral and Dubai Air Show was like, come and host our show. So that's kind of the domino effect of how I got into it. And the more you do it, the better and more confident you get. Um, but I got really confident hosting, but not doing keynote speeches or mm. anything like that. And then eventually domino effect of, you know, posting on social media and word of mouth. I got invited to do a TEDx speech and it just continued to grow that way. Um, and I remember even when I hired my coach, she's like, we have to write down goals and decide what it is you want to achieve. And when I wrote down, I want to be a TED level speaker, I just said that as an uh, unattainable goal, like I want to do TED, like, you know, as something that is something I'm, I probably won't even end up doing, but that's the level I want to be at. And then a couple of months later, that's exactly what I ended up doing. So write it down, manifest, it works. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, just to go back on this, there are so many things I want to point out here, but I did see you at that conference for the first time. And I remember you were on a panel first right I was on a panel only yeah I just came for one yes so I think I've just been to watch so much of your stuff now oh. <laughs> but yeah on the panel I remember I was about to walk out from that panel because I was I was so hungry and then I remember <laughs> the first few people spoke and I was like okay I'm just gonna go grab something to eat and then you started talking and I just sat down again really? I was like oh sh I like her vibe let me listen to her <laughs> and I was on a panel as well I always tried to not tone it down, but just try to like be more level because mm. it's not all about me. Of course. So, yes, no, I didn't know I did that to you. Yeah. You reacted that way. You made me wait for my food. <laughs> Girl, you yeah. know how important food is. Exactly. So I'm so flattered. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So honestly, though, I think uh, people underestimate how much their personality and their vibe really com comes out when yeah. you are talking, especially in public. And as you said, confidence is just a muscle. You yeah. need to work on it and it, it will only come from practice. Yeah. Because that's a question I get a lot of times, which is how 
how do you become confident? How are you so confident? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times, so I'll, story time for me. So yes. when I'm doing public speaking, so mm. I did a TEDx as well. Yeah. And I have an issue that for me, the way my nerves manifest is that my ears heat up. Oh, yeah. Especially the top here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my sister would love it. She'll just put an ice cube there and you will see it melt, melt. immediately. Oh, wow. So just these two. And I'm just there with these heating up. But obviously I am pretending is yeah, what yeah. you do, right? You have to put that mask on. Yeah, like you put it makeup. on. I mean, like Beyonce does Sasha Pierce. Have you heard of this? No. So Beyonce has an alter ego that she calls Sasha Pierce. Oh. And she's the one that performs on stage. Oh, yes, I understand that. Yeah, so, yeah. She, so sw she switches on Sasha Pierce before going on stage because oh. she's the sassy woman that can perform. Oh, yes, I understand right? that. I, I have one, but I haven't named her anything appropriate yet. Okay, we need to find a name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think then it just comes from practicing and a lot of us are just faking it until you make it, right? Oh, 100%. And I think just having that very honest conversation of doesn't mean that because somebody's doing it that they are very comfortable doing it. They're just yeah. pushing their comfort zone a bit. Oh further away a hundred percent that's why like even on social media i post but every time i post i'm like oh like i actually got nervous about posting anything like you know really yeah i do um what would, makes you nervous i don't know i just think it's like i'm putting my life out there and i know that the information i'm putting out like my instagram stories is just so you get to know what i do day to day mm -hmm. and like humanize me um but then like you know the the uh, motivational content the educational content and things like that that I do put out there I know the educational content especially is going to help people find a path possibly because when I googled air traffic control um 10 11 years ago there was hardly anything available I watched like an old documentary on YouTube that I had to pray the subtitle said the correct thing <laughs> <laughs> so I could go to the interview with knowledge, yeah. you know, so that's why I created that platform. So the educational one, I'm very confident in what I put out there. Mm. But anytime I post anything motivational or like personal about me, I'm just like, oh, no, I just, I'm just shy to share that, even mm. though I'm such I'm not even an extrovert and I'm extreme extrovert. You are. So, um, yeah, but there is that like shyness. And even before I go on stage, no matter what, my legs buckle. Mm. like you and I are comfortable with each other where we were sat in the lounge earlier yeah. just like chatting away and for me it's my cheeks and my legs buckle oh. so that's the effect you have on me today <laughs> well nobody ever said that to me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so I think we all have that and I think it's important to speak about it as mm. well because people don't talk about that and like even my podcast I talk about things that I feel are important to be spoken about because everyone believes there's sh everything should be picture perfect but half the things I post like when I do post my face most of the time it's like a zoomed in you can see my nostril maybe a booger and that's what I'm showing because this is the reality of how I take photos to the people that I love yeah you know so yeah oh I love that you mentioned that because the first time I recorded the podcast this season and I looked at it and I was like I'm not used to that angle oh, yeah. where there are two people so I'm usually just in front of the camera alone yeah, yeah. in my house yeah 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 and the front one is still fine but I was looking at myself from the side I was like is that what people have been seeing this whole time and nobody said anything to me no, this is how I sit <laughs> all your angles are great it's just a matter of perspective right but it is but then I was like okay I'm not gonna let that stop me from yeah. posting the content yeah, because exactly. I just sit with my back curved I just need to fix my posture but it is that thing of as you said I am very critical of mm. things that I need to put up and I, I keep thinking oh my god but what if someone says this is a bit controversial I might hurt some people's feelings but then at the end of the day you know a friend of mine always said that that there's the spotlight effect right where have you heard of this mm -mm, no so we all go through life assuming that there is a spotlight on us mm -hmm. and everyone is watching what we're doing because mm -hmm. we're in the light but the the reality of things is that everyone feels that way so everyone is so consumed in like taking care of how they are coming across to others yeah. that they're actually not looking at you so no oh, yeah. one is looking at exactly. you exactly it's like even um uh, I'm very body positive as well. So like, you know, if if I'm wearing a swimsuit or whatever, I'm like, well, I've showed up and I've got all these curves and everyone has to deal with it. What am I going to do? And <laughs> yeah. I've been sharing that with all my friends as well that, you know, if they were ever insecure about their bodies. And, you know, I 
would tell them, I'm like, why are you so worried about your jiggles? Everyone's worried about their jiggles. And then, That's but for exactly me, it. exactly. But I never thought about it in that way with everything. I'm just yeah. like, it's just jiggles on the beach. <laughs> That's how I always thought of it. This is much better than the spotlight effect. <laughs> Everyone's worried about their own jiggles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jiggle away. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So again, like where does all of this confidence come from? Like body positivity? Because for me, I feel like with age, it got better. You know, mm. I just stopped caring as we were discussing earlier. I don't wear heels anymore. Yeah. I don't really care that much. I would happily go to work without makeup on. Yeah. Um, but where did, where did it come from for you? Mm, well, to go to the heels and the going to yeah. work with no makeup. So like just for context for everybody, I walked onto the on here barefoot yes after taking my crocs off and put on my little heels so you can see how cute these are my sitting heels even very shiny heels. crocs by the way. <laughs> very shiny <laughs> um you know and then even when i go to work i take it as an opportunity to i used to go to work with a lot of makeup mm -hmm. and then i think just before the pandemic and everything i was like oh, why am i killing myself to look so cute for with all these different shifts like what's the point and um there was also so much else going on in life like i was studying univ at university um you know and I also like to socialize and like live life so there were so many things I was juggling so I decided to like almost Mark Zuckerberg it and create a uniform when I go to work so it's like a very comfortable abaya mm -hmm. pockets most important because I don't we like handbags pockets. and the abaya the 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 sleeves roll down when I'm working so it doesn't bother me and interfere and all these little things I thought of and I created this design so it can work more efficiently rather than think about how I look. And when I go to work, I've got that like glass, glass skin because it is caked in all the products my dermatologist told me to put on. Okay. Yeah. And then I can come and, you know, do these talks and my skin is ready. I don't have to put as much foundation, mm. which is a win. And I feel like having that bare canvas look the way that you want it to look instead of covering it up was so important. And growing up, my mom was really big on skincare. So I kind of adopted that from her as well. Um, but the confidence just comes from deciding what it is that you want. Because I feel like a lot of the times we do tend to dress up and things like that is because that's what we think is expected of us. And I think over here in the UAE as well, especially in Dubai, like even people that are going to like spinnies or waitros are like so dressed up. Why? Tell me about it. I go in my pajamas sometimes to the coffee yeah. downstairs and everyone is so dressed up. And I, I exactly. literally went back once. I was like, I can't do this. And it's like, you know, so... <laughs> I just stopped, I decided I don't care because what's the point in me choosing to live up to the standard I think everybody else wants of me? And again, spotlight effect. They're not looking at you. Mm -mm. And if they are, they're really insecure about whatever they're going through, mm. if they're going to start judging you. And I realized when I truly, genuinely stopped caring, because at the beginning you're doing it because, oh, well, I just want to. And then when I really stopped caring, people were like, I commend you. Mm. Like even when I, um, even now when I go out with my husband, I've trained him to, just wear sweats and a nice shirt. Like, not a nice shirt, but, like, just something comfortable. Mm. And, like, you know, cute loungewear. Yeah. Like, we have a full, like, going out loungewear. Love that. Yeah. Like, even now, after this, I'm going to change into loungewear and go watch a movie with him. Mm. You know? But this is PR, Joe. This is my... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it? Sasha Pierce? Sasha Pierce. Yes. This is your mm -hmm. Sasha Pierce. Yes, exactly. We need to find a name for you. <laughs> yeah, we do. Because, yeah, I have... I, I know what brings her out. And it's, like, some raunchy music before I get to work. Mm. But I need to find a name for her. So far, I just call her PR Joe. P oh, I like that. Yeah, like, I like that. You know? Um, so, yeah, what were we talking about? Yeah, I we forgot, just, but I have a question <laughs> now, which is um, Did you grow up in the UAE? Yeah, born and raised. Where does the accent come from? So, this is going to sound very pretentious. Oh, let's hear it. But they call it the private school accent here. Okay. It's very common for people kids to go to a private school versus government mm -hmm. and I went to a government school and then my mom decided to put us all in private um, private school and that was her decision from a very young age so there are children from all across the world that speak with this accent mm. if they were born and raised here or even if they were raised here in those formative years they pick up this twang so I was even speaking to one of the ladies at work um, I was asking her how her kids are and, um, you know, now they've all gone to university and everything. And she's like, she's Irish, like full Irish. Mm -hmm. her, her children are full Irish as well. And they, her daughter has an American twang in her accent. And it's just <laughs> part of that private school accent that you have over here. And it just mm. rubs off on everybody. Okay. Yeah. So that's where it comes from.
Okay, well, I have a question. What was it like growing up in the UAE? And things must have changed a lot since oh, yeah. then, right? Huge. Like, getting to Mall of Emirates was like driving to the end of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> no Serious, way. yeah. It was like, you want to go where? When I would tell this my car. mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Mall of Emirates was like the end of Dubai. Like, wow. you know that old Toyota building? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was the end of Dubai. No way. Yeah, like that was like the end and there was like desert everywhere. So, yeah, that's what it was. Um, but growing up here, growing up here was good. I wouldn't change anything. Um, the circum I had a difficult childhood, but that was just based on family issues yeah. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it was really good. Um, I got to go to, I moved to different schools. Um, I am very open about the fact that I did get bullied in school. But when oh, I, wow. yeah, when I decided to stop, allowing myself to get bullied and bully the bullies back, mm -hmm. but not like bully, bully, unless they were really provocative. Mm. Um, that's when there was a shift. And then I started to be more accepted because they're like, oh, well, we can't pick on her anymore. So, She's not fun to pick on anymore. Yeah, right? exactly. Like I didn't feed them with what it is that they were looking for. Mm. So um, I did go through bullying in school. Eventually I overcame it. And it's because I stood up for myself hard mm. um and i think it also helps with uh the fact that i moved to a new school when i made the decision to stop being bullied right yeah like have you heard priyanka chopra's book or like yeah yeah so like you know how she says um you know her father told her well you have to move a lot but you get to choose who you are every time you move right yes so i made that decision when i entered eighth grade when i moved to the last school and um that's when I was like, I'm not going to get bullied anymore. That's it. And before I was a very quiet child, like, and I was so skinny because the kids would like throw my food out of my hands because they weren't used to like the dishes my grandma would make. They're like, what mm -hmm. is that? And just knock it. So I would just be this like scared, quiet, like hide in the bathroom kind of child. And then when I moved to the eighth grade, I was like, this is a new school. My mom put me in a co-ed school because she saw I was becoming extremely shy, even though my nature wasn't like that when I was very young. And she's like, we need to have a shift. You're going to be comfortable around men and women because the schools here, they become segregated after a certain grade. I can't okay. remember what it is, um, like gender segregation. My mom's like, I don't want you to be shy around men. You need to mm. show up and own it. So when she put me into the new school, I was like, I'm not going to get bullied anymore. And I went from the quiet girl to, oh, my God, she's so loud. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was really squeaky, too. Oh, wow. Because my voice has deepened a lot after I got my tonsils removed as an adult. Okay. But I was, really? It affects your voice? I did not know that. Well, I don't think it was supposed to, but I accept it. It helps me with my career, to be honest. Good, yeah. Pilots go like, thank you, sir. Ma'am? question mark <laughs> no way yeah they get confused especially after i've taken a nap oh like if i take a nap um on break of course mm -hmm. on break and i come back and i haven't spoken yet and i have that Hi, everyone. yeah very husky yeah i go from jehena to jamal like <laughs> um, yeah wow well you know it seems like your mom was very played a very important role in yeah. your formative years in terms of like building your confidence and making sure that you know you don't have to feel bad about who you are and accept who you are yeah right yeah exactly and even my grandmother too because my mother was working to build her business when I was young so I actually spent a lot of time with my grandmother and she would be the one who would like dust me off and like get me to stand up again and my auntie was visiting us often as well mm -hmm. so you know she always used to tell me um she tells me so all these stories of like my childhood and I'm like really I was cheeky since then <laughs> um <laughs> You know, so I had their influence with me from very early on. And I feel like all three of them, that blend is what gave me that confidence, that boost, that girl that has her head screwed onto her shoulders. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, I, I might have gotten bullied, but I always knew what I wanted to do with myself and things like that and how I would conduct myself. Mm. I didn't know what I wanted in life. I just knew how to present myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's really cool. And I think um, one thing is, um, what is it like being an Emirati woman? Because I feel like we hear a lot of things about, you know, what the Emirati culture is. But now I have the, the chance to ask someone. Yeah. So what is it like being an Emirati woman? And, you know, you have an unconventional path as well. Yeah. What is it like? Um, well, the family I come from is... Um, it's very like Emirati and the, mm. you know, we have our tribe name and everything. And when people read my name from like a passport or a formal document, they're like, wait a minute, 
They just look at me. They're like, that's not because we're so purely Emirati. Right. The, the name. Mm. Um, and then, you know, my father was the first one to marry outside. Mm. So it, he broke a, the stigma. He broke a stigma. He broke the stereotype in that way as well. So um, I don't think I'm the best person to ask about what it's like to be uh like purely Emirati because I've had so many different influences being mixed race and, you know, traveling to visit my auntie often when we were younger to the States and stuff. Uh, but how I feel as a woman who is Emirati living in the UAE, I just feel like a lot of pride. I feel like I'm very patriotic with the work I do mm -hmm. because when I speak, I always say like, I get to protect the skies of my country, like, yes. you know, and I'm so proud and grateful that I can do that. I don't take it for granted at all. Um, so in that way, I feel like I'm very patriotic um, and I'm grateful to be here because, you know, we're a country that accepts so many people from different backgrounds. And it's been like that for a very long time. Yeah. It's such a massive melting pot and people come here and they're like, oh, I'm only going to come on vacation and then move here for decades, yeah. you know, and it's so nice to be able to be a part of that and be like, our home is so welcoming to everybody. Mm. So for me, it's just nice to be able to live in my own country and experience different cultures as well. Um, you know, like even I married outside of my culture completely. My husband's European. So I just feel like I'm not the, I'm not that this, the whatever stereotype it is that is Emirati to ask that question. Mm -hmm. But I can just say that I'm super proud, very grateful. The opportunity given to me to become an air traffic controller was a government program and it was for Emiratis. So the fact that I was blessed to have that and the opportunity they gave me and the responsibility and trust they had in me from such a young age, I was 19, um, you know, I'm just so grateful for that. But at the same time, I feel like you are the example of what the country represents, right? It's just welcoming to everybody and everyone is, you know, part of this melting pot, as you said. And yeah. even me, you, I felt like you were talking about me that I came for holiday and I stayed. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> I love that because I've, I've watched snippets of your social media and everything. And I was like, I know you moved here two years ago. Yes, I did. So, yeah, it's that's not it. even been two years, but yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, Welcome. I, I love the country so far. Honestly, I mean, I had only been here on holiday for two days and I decided one year later, I decided to move. Yeah. So it's just so great. And like, I don't realize um, how lucky I am as well, especially because I haven't traveled as much with the pandemic. But every time I travel, I come back, I'm like, Alhamdulillah, I love, I love my country. Like oh we take so much for granted here, I feel, because everything you ever want, you can just WhatsApp, call or download an app and it's done for you. The convenience. <laughs> yeah, the convenience, the efficiency, everything. And as a woman, you're, I could walk out any time in the night and I'm completely safe, comfortable, all of that. Yeah. Whereas you can't say that in other parts of the world. Exactly. I've lived in the UK for nine years mm -hmm. and I, I find it really funny because the first time I knew that Dubai is now home is I went to Turkey. When I flew back, I arrived at the Dubai airport and I, I felt emotional. I was like, oh my God, I feel like I've landed back in civilization. <laughs> <laughs> Just because it, here you feel like everything is under control and yeah. I know what I'm doing. Everything is safe. I'm always safe. Yeah. And then now, you know, when you walk through the gates, mm. um, you don't even need your passport now. And it says, welcome back, Sheen. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, yes. I am home. <laughs> so yeah, it's exactly. Been, definitely. I agree with the safety stuff as well, because yeah. here at like 3 a.m. you can go to the beach and yeah. it's all fine and it's crowded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, you're going to be okay. And that's something that, again, I don't take that for granted whatsoever, but I definitely get a reality check every time I travel. I'm like, oh, just, just grateful. That's, yeah. that's the feeling. Just <laughs> alhamdulillah, grateful. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. But what, what's in the future now for you, you think? The future? Well, so this is a podcast I'm recording with you and mm -hmm. I have the next two days I have two and I'm going very short term to mm -hmm. explain big picture. Um, I have another podcast recording and I'm doing an ad um, for a company. And then after that, I'm taking a pause because I just feel like I need to do that. Like I accepted to come and do this podcast with you just because I liked you and we vibed. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. But I just feel like I need to pause and just focus on my health because in the pandemic, I gained a lot of weight as well. And I feel uncomfortable in my body. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, well, I need to work on that. So I'm going to work on that. 
Um, and I just feel I need to just be present with everything that I've done because I have had a lot of change in the last year. And the only way for me to move forward is to reflect on the past and decide what I want to do with myself in the present for the future. So for example, in the last year, I got married, we bought a house, I built my dogs a house, so two houses, um, <laughs> you know, and I really want to ask myself what I want to do next. There's so many different avenues I have, and I'm blessed to say, alhamdulillah, I have them. So for example, I realized I'm really good at making some cute candles. And every time I gift it to someone, I ran out, so I didn't bring you one. But every time I gift it to someone, they're like, please sell it. And the markup that people are telling me they would pay is insane. Ooh. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll do candles. And then I started my podcast as well in the last year. And it's just me sat at home talking about my feelings. It's almost like a personal journal, but like a little filtered for the, the public because who of knows course. who listens to it. Mm. Um, so I really like podcasting and that's something I've learned I like to do as well. So candles, podcasting, my art, people love my art. And some people even told me they want me to tattoo them. And I was like, well, I don't think there's a female Emirati that is tattooing anyone. Mm -mm. So maybe that's something I could look into. So there's just a lot of different things I need to decide on what it is I want to do because I don't like to have, I don't like to have, well, how do I, how do I say half-assed without saying half-assed? Say it. <laughs> just say it. I, I, <laughs> PR Joe took yeah. over. She's like, wait beep. a minute. I'll do the beep. <laughs> okay. um, you know, and I don't want to give 10% on 10 different things and then it's 100 versus um, just choosing one thing and doing it really well. Mm. So I have a couple ideas on what it is that I want to do, but I need to do that soul searching and um, find out exactly what it is that I want to do for myself. Um, so yeah, so I'm not sure what the future holds, but all I know is what I feel is that I want to uh, do my master's degree. Again, I'm not sure psychology or physics, uh, psychology or artificial intelligence, because I got accepted to both. And I was like, why do both of you want me? If one rejected, then it would help me make a decision. Oh my God, that's so interesting. Why did you apply for these two things? So artificial intelligence is what is expected of me. That's yeah. the future. Mm. Psychology, I get along with people and they tell me all their deep, dark secrets. So I should get paid for it. Mm. <laughs> so, um, and also uh, I realized I have a knack for helping people with their mental health because air traffic control training is extremely stressful. And I've been an exact, um, sorry, I've been an instructor for... I think two and a half or three years now. And I've gotten a lot of trainees through their training. And I feel like the reason why I have a higher success rate is because I tell them to tell me their feelings. I'm like, no, no one else is going to know, but you need to talk to me about how you feel. Mm. And now, you know, there's a lot of machoism, not just in air traffic control, but even in Emirati culture with the men. Like, I've never seen, you know, a cousin cry or like an yeah. uncle, like, never, you know. And then with me, I'm like, you have to tell me how you feel, <laughs> you know, because if you're not on your A game or if there's something in outside of work that is impacting you, you might say the wrong thing and then you're creating a safety risk. Yeah. So you need to be transparent and tell me, Jehena, today I'm not feeling it. Then I know I can support you more. Mm. But otherwise, I let them sit there. I'm like, work, what do you want me to do? Figure it out. And <laughs> that's the way they learn. Yeah. Um, so in helping all of these students succeed... And, you know, their training um, stayed on track because it's tough to make it in air traffic control. And the fact that I've helped all of these, mostly men, because, again, it's male-dominated, I've had one female trainee, which I'm so proud of, and she finished. Yes. Um, but the other boys that I've helped out, um, and I say boys because they were younger than me, and I treat them <laughs> like they're like my children, you know, yeah. um, and they would tell me about whatever it is that they're going through, no matter how big or small. And then I've taught them how to fuel that to help them in their career versus bring them down. Mm. And it stems from my experience because I chose not to allow the difficulties at home bring me down, but fuel me to succeed as an air traffic controller. And um, in being able to do that and help different people succeed, like I was on a night shift last night and I had a completely new student. And this is my first expat student that I'm teaching. And all my boys, the local boys are like, oh, you're with Jehena? She's the reason why I passed. Aww. And you know, my heart melted because they never <laughs> told me that. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm on a night shift, I'm tired. So I got a little emotional, I'm like, oh, I love it. <laughs> so, but it feels so good. So, mm. and part of that I feel is because of the way I helped them change their way of thinking with their mental health and everything like that. But it, 
doesn't come from any education. It comes from gut instinct. Mm -hmm. So imagine if I had the knowledge behind it, like the written knowledge. Mm. So that's why I'm a little bit torn. Should I go with what the future is and what's expected of me or do I follow my heart? I think it's clear, isn't yeah. it? It is. Forget AI. Everyone yeah. is doing AI these days. <laughs> they are. I Yeah. To be honest, I wanted to get into it before it became a thing, though. Right. So bef when it started to just become a buzzword or it was almost there, mm. that's when I had applied a couple of years ago. And then for psychology, I applied more recently. And then I was like, oh, no. Okay. No, mm, not yet. Oh. <laughs> I was busy living life. Of course. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I interrupted you. You were saying master's is one option. Yeah. So master's. Mm. And then I really like making candles and I love going to like the ripe market mm -hmm. and I love talking to everyone there. Like it's such a vibe. So I'd love to like sell candles at the ripe market. That's another thing that I could enjoy. Um, and I like to do, you know, mm. um, and I got into candle pouring as well because of my allergies, all the Bath and Body Works candles weren't agreeing with me with the paraffin wax. Right. So I made my own beeswax candles and it wow. purifies the air and it makes your house smell good. Yeah. Wow. Two in one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, th those are the kind of candles I started pouring. So I could do that. Um, I love podcasting. So even when you invited me here, I'm like, it's so pretty. Yeah. Should I record mine here? You should. <laughs> you know, so um, just a lot of different ideas in that way. Um, there's another part of me that wants to do a podcast with my dogs. So you just come to my house and you pour your heart out to me with Please. my dogs around you. I'm there. Because honestly, like I've had like close friends over and there's just something about sitting with the dogs and the things that come out. I'm like, wow, that's deep. Right. I should record that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but that's like a good mix of everything you want to do as well. Right. Yeah. It's like speaking to people, also getting yeah. them to like open up yeah. and be around your dogs, do yeah. content, everything exactly. in one go. Yeah, exactly. Just like come to my house. We'll go to the dog house and we'll have a chat. Yes. So, yeah. So this is, so these are the things I'm thinking about um, how I'm going to choose to execute. I'm this is the part where I'm so uh, precise with everything I choose to do. And I'm a perfectionist. So if I'm going to do it, I have to do it well or I'm not doing it at all. Mm. So I have to pick. Mm. So I need to take time to decide what it is I want to do. That's so interesting because I'm going through the same thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. So for me, my career has been... So my dad always says that in a very funny way. He's like, I've worked at the same place my whole life, which at 33 years, okay? And he just retired. And he was like, you have been in the workforce for less than two years and you've resigned three times. Oh, wow. <laughs> And I was like, well, when you put it that way, but I did, I was a consultant, mm -hmm. uh, hated the lifestyle. Yeah. Then I, now I'm part of like a startup. So a tech mm -hmm. startup doing that. Uh, it's fun, but also I do content creation mm -hmm. and I, I love the podcast so much. And I yeah. also love teaching. I've started teaching part time Yeah. and just generally doing YouTube videos, doing yeah. public speaking. There's so much that I want to do, mm. but I don't know how to pick it. And I think yeah. you have the same problem, right? Because yeah. there are, because, and then my friend was like, go through this exercise where you think about what skills do you have and you're very good at, mm. what are the problems in the world that you want to solve? Yeah. And then what are the, what was the last one? Like, what is the medium that you want mm. to use to mix these two? Is it in terms oh. of teaching, content creation? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I need to do this exercise. But it's just because I'm like you. I want to do a lot of things. All of it. But I, there are two issues. One is time. You can't do everything. Yeah. And the second thing is you need to make money. And a lot oh, of things yeah. that I want to make do not are not going to make money immediately. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. And that's why with air traffic control, like, you know, many people think they're like, oh, it is a stressful job. It's mm. taxing. But if I'm working full time, I still get 12 days off a month. Mm -hmm. I'm exhausted the first day off of my days off. Yes. But, you know, that's still 12 days off a month to choose what it is I want to channel my energy towards. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, this is the only, this is the difference in the advantage I have. Um, but I mean, I, for me, I just give all my money away to my family anyway. So I'm just like <laughs> sat there. OK, <laughs> I need to find something else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I want something more so I can, you know, um, like I retired my mom, but I want her to like get whatever she wants, whenever she of wants, course. however she wants. Mm. And the only way to do that is to pour candles and speak a lot and <laughs> do all these uh, public speaking events and, and, and. Right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, and also public speaking. I love doing the public speaking as well. Um, and this year I decided I'm going to start charging people. So I went from extremely popular to how much did you want again? So, again, even in a career where I'm like, 
you want me to come, you want me to represent, you want an uh, Emirati face there who is going to, who has trained to do this, to host a conference, moderate a panel, uh, do a keynote, whatever it is you need me to do, I'll show up and I'll do it. But because I put a fee there, people stopped uh, wanting to hire me because they're like, oh, well, we can get so-and-so for free. Mm. And I was like, the problem is people are choosing to work for free when their knowledge is so niche to certain things. Well, charge everyone. Don't be shy about it either. I feel like there's a lot of people that are shy to even demand, like, this is my price, pay yeah. as well, you know? Yeah, it's tough though. I have a huge problem. It, just yesterday, my friend was telling me off because I get invited by a lot of universities to do guest lecturing oh. and I don't get paid. What? And I've been doing it for free. We're gonna and, and we're gonna like, have a conversation. She was like, "What is your problem?" Yeah. <laughs> she was like, "You can't." You're sharing all this knowledge, right? Yeah. And I was like, "My time is valuable. It is, and I am taking my time out, and I don't understand. Like, it's not like I'm doing it for one person. It's a huge corporation. You yeah. have the money. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. So I don't understand why am I doing this for free? And I was like, "Oh, it's it's that fear of if I ask for a fee." They'll be like, oh, that's okay. We'll find someone else for free. Yeah, exactly. But also, you know, when I when I started doing that, I was really uncomfortable. But again, growing up, and this also stems from my childhood, because that mindset, I had that mindset before. It shifted when I got into air traffic because it's a set salary. And then now I've had to kind of shift back again because I've chosen to create a business out of public speaking. Right. So growing up, I helped my mom with her business. So I would be the one that would send people their bills and be like, please remember to bring this much. Mm. We do not accept card because mm -hmm. those days you could get away with that. Yeah. Um, please bring cash for the following amount. Your breakdown is ba 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 ba. And I was like 13, 14, like already doing all this. So I have no shame yeah and being like this is our price please pay mm. and this is the form of payment we accept um and then when i had to switch that back again at the beginning it was a little bit awkward and now i've flowed back into it i'm like thank you so much for your interest i'm gonna send you a proposal please send me your email you send the proposal and it's a wonderful proposal these are my fees period mm. and then this is what you send out there and how I've chosen to see it as well, because air traffic control, even though I have the time off, it is mentally demanding. It is. If people choose not to pay me to come to the events now, then I'm going to be like, okay, well, you're saving me the time and energy and mm. preparation. Um, certain events I do because I'm really passionate. So mm -hmm. like next month I'm speaking at a school because I love working with kids. So if it's a cause that I really like and I support, of course I'm going to be there. There's even a cause in November and I offered to host the, the conference. It's uh, for um, eliminating cervical cancer in Africa. Okay. And I really like the lady. She was actually at the oh, convention. I, yes. Linda. Yes, Linda. Yes, yes. of course. I'm, sp I'm working with Linda as well now. Yeah, so I'm going to host. Are you coming in November? I am. Girl. Girl, my company is there as well. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> So I'll be hosting that one. Okay. Feel free to come. And I was coincidentally off for that. So, but I would have taken annual leave for it mm. because I'm so passionate about it. Even Dubai Air Show, I'll show up and, you know, I want to be a part of that and everything. So if it's something I'm really passionate about, especially if it has to do with children or women's health mm -hmm. or anyone's health, actually, you know, yeah. um, I'll take part. But if it's a huge corporation and you're asking me to come and host your show for free and your booths are going for tens of thousands of dollars and you're telling me you can't spare this much to mm. support an Emirati public speaker, then yeah. that's fine. That's Please fine. continue with whoever else you'd like to work yeah. with. But I've decided that I'm going to stick with that. Mm. But it was tough to do this transition though. Right. And as you said, you went from being popular to less yeah, in demand, right? I was doing at least, I have what 12 days off a month without annual leave. And I think at least six of those days I would be doing public speaking wow. back to back to back to back you know how many abayas colorful abayas I have I in my closet there's a whole <laughs> rainbow um and then there's still colors and then sparkling like mm. I had to have a full variation for the evening ones right yeah. yeah exactly you know so um that's the thing and I went from doing 50% of my days off were concentrated on events. And then now I have the time to slow down. And in that slowing down, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to be more selective about which podcast I choose to sit in, mm -hmm. which uh, event I choose to go to. Because I am still getting invitations, but if it doesn't, if I'm not vibing, yeah, it's as simple as if I'm not vibing, I'm not going to be there. For sure. Yeah. I've chosen to be more selective with my energy as well. Mm. 
No, that's solid advice because I think really putting a price on our time is important. Yeah. Because it is our time at the end of the day. And as you said, it takes preparation. Yeah, exactly. You prepare, you turn up and then you perform and then you're just like, oh, well, all of that was for free. I yeah. got exposure. <laughs> exactly. And you know, like uh, you would never heard about air traffic control. No. But I've conducted air traffic control workshops and created that into a team building exercise, which I incorporate at like these corporate events mm. and it teaches people about a new job that they can go home and tell their kids about and maybe add to the gen the the workforce in the future it teaches you how to b work as a team by trusting others with because of the way i created the certain game um and even for that and i've put in all that time effort and created a one-of-a-kind game that i'm sure nobody else is doing mm. around the world and explaining to you a job that it took my mom 10 years to understand what I do <laughs> because when I created that PowerPoint presentation and I used my mom as like my guinea pig audience, she's like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so not everyone is going to show up and explain it the way that you will explain it and spread exactly. the knowledge the way that you spread it. And I stopped you from eating. Yeah. So if I have that allure, please <laughs> <laughs> pay you. Yeah. yeah. Like there was even one. Um, a uh, conference organizer and I always vibe with them backstage and the tech team and mm. like we're always like having a little bit of a laugh in silence because you know the show is going on and I remember he told me that I had to announce a coffee break with no coffee and he was like I'm, I'm I feel sorry for you Ooh. and <laughs> I can't remember like it was just a one-liner that I used and I went up there and um I went up there and I was like, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'd like to announce that we're going for a coffee break, but we're going to choose to feed our souls instead of ourselves because we want you to network <laughs> with one another. And I got people clapping. Oh, my God. And he's, he looked at me. He's like, what? How did you, you do that? You got people clapping by telling them that they're not going to get coffee on a coffee break? I'm like, girl. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, and then the same company that told me to uh, come back and I was like, oh, by the way, I started charging again, who saw my ability were like, no. No way. See, that's the frustrating part. Yeah. They've seen your work. Exactly. So it's disheartening, but also at the same time, honestly, the fact that I get to chill on that day instead of go to the event and I get, um, I give it my all. Same. I don't even give it my all. I give it 150%. Mm. I come home with no voice fatigue and I'm so tired. I don't eat and mm. I love food. Exactly. Yeah. Like I'll just sit with the dogs. I won't even pet them. I'll just like sit there because <laughs> I'm so done after an event. It, for me, it's more taxing than doing an air traffic control shift mm. and air traffic control is intense. So yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, okay, last question I think I have for you today okay. is um, you've had such an incredible path, right? You went from ballet dancer to yeah, air from the age of control, four. <laughs> right from the age of four. Yeah. And now you do public speaking, you do candles, you do everything. What advice do you have for people who are also, you know, trying to do unconventional things and when things get hard or facing rejections, how do you keep going? Um so no matter what, you're always going to get rejection. And part of progression is failure because it just means that that didn't work. So you, ooh, oopsie, okay. that didn't work. So you have to choose to do another method to reach that goal. And then that just means you're gaining more experience in that. So it's all about perspective again, you know. Um, so make the decision on what it is you want to do because you could be taking an unconventional path because you're like, I want to do something different. Um, but what you're meant to do is something that is conventional. So decide what it is you want to do first. That's the most important thing. And if you look at anybody, um, anybody who is successful as well, like if you ask Oprah Winfrey, what does every successful person have in common or anybody else of her caliber? She will say they knew what they wanted to do. So first thing, find out what it is you want to do. Second thing, when you've figured out what you want to do, trace back on how to get there and build that plan. And for me, I'm all about having plan A, B, C, D, E. So come up with a contingency when that doesn't work out or if that doesn't work out. And then after that, when you have come to your goal and I'm assuming you've continued to continue on this path and reach your goal, remember that you can ask for help in that journey. Because I feel like a lot of people are like, no, I need to do this on my own, it's my thing, I'm not gonna share my idea so nobody copies it, blah, blah, blah. But no one's gonna do it like you will. So 
choose to have people around you that you know you can truly lean on because it's not going to be easy. And if you're going to do it alone, you're going to struggle. So choose to lean on somebody. And if you don't trust anyone, get a therapist. <laughs> Pay that Great. person. Yeah. yeah. Pay that person, and there are even some nonprofit organizations that will do it for free or for cheap. Mm -hmm. So if you don't trust anyone, get a therapist mm -hmm. or a life coach or whatever it is you need to, just so you have that person to lean on and help guide you and put you back on the path. Mm. And then when you've reached that goal, it's going to be the best feeling ever, but also super overwhelming because now you've reached there. And then what? And I feel like not a lot of people speak about that and then what? So remember I told you when I was doing public speaking, when I signed up with my coach, she asked me, what do you want to reach? And I was like, I want to do a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. And then when I reached that point and I did the TED Talk, we prepared for years on end and worked on, um, or months on end. I can't remember. I lost the timeline. But I worked really hard for a very long time. And when I reached that point, I was so overwhelmed with emotion that afterwards we went to go eat breakfast and I'm sat... <laughs> in the restaurant and I just needed to have some sort of release. So I'm just sat there like <laughs> crying, but like an ugly crying. Cause I never cried no as a way. child. I never cried as a child. So I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. It's all, <laughs> and it's exactly like this. <laughs> and then you see a tear and you're like, oh my God, it's real. And I do it shamelessly in public. I don't care. I never cried in 26 years. And I started crying a few years ago. Oh my God. That's when my feelings suddenly came out. So I'm just sat there crying. And my husband is so used to this. So he's like feeding me a sigh. He's like, like, like she, needs, she needs sugar. <laughs> And I'm just sat there like, mm, no. Nah. And my mom's like, what's wrong with you? Like, stop it. And I'm like, I need to feel. It needs to come out. <laughs> and it just had to come out, yeah. you know. And it's that cortisol release. Mm. I read about it somewhere. So it just had to come out. So whatever you need to do, <laughs> probably I shouldn't go to a restaurant after I've achieved Maybe something. Not. Maybe not. I need to go straight <laughs> home to the dog house I built for my dogs <laughs> to let it out. But it's important to acknowledge that once you've reached there, it's okay to feel lost because like you said, even you who's doing so much, you're like, okay, but what, mm -hmm. what, what, what? So it's okay to acknowledge that. And when you've reached that mountain or you've reached the top of your mountain um, to say, okay, well, what am I going to do now? And how am I, am I going to choose to sustain it? Or is it time to go down and build another one? And in that time as well, it's okay if you choose to leave that and do something else. Because if the next thing is your true passion, then go for it. Mm -hmm. But remember to take that moment of appreciating, oh, I did it. Because usually when you've accomplished something, I feel like people don't appreciate the fact that they've done it. And then it's like, go, 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 next, next, next. What's what next, else? right? Yeah. And I've seen a lot of people who have accomplished huge things. They've reached that point and then their health deteriorates. And health is everything. Mm. So how are you going to continue doing what you've achieved if your health isn't there? So... Go cry and eat a sigh. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> After you've achieved. <laughs> so, yeah. So I feel like these are the steps. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to be patient um, in that whole journey as well. But the, the core of it, 50% of that is knowing what you're going to do. And then making sure you take the steps necessary to do it. Because you can't write it down and that manifestation alone is going to be there. You have to take the steps to do it. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a positive <laughs> note to end this on. Yes. Thank you so much for being here with us. It Thank you for having me. It was lovely to speak to you. Yeah, and same. I've learned so much. Thank you. I learned more about you as well, which I love. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, see you next time. Thank you. See you.